Brothers and sisters, aloha. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I'd like to thank President Wheelwright for inviting me to introduce my husband today. I don't know if you were brave or crazy. You took a risk. <laughs> because there's not much I enjoy more than elaborating on one of my very favorite topics. I hope I can contain myself because I could write volumes about this man. I have studied him for many years. I met Shane Bowen when I was a senior at BYU. He had returned from his mission to Chile just one year previously. I had always planned to marry a man who loved the Lord, was a hard worker, and treated me with kindness and respect. I knew that a man with those qualities would provide the leadership and means for a happy family life. During our short courtship, it was obvious to me that my three requirements were important values to him as well. I noticed quickly how seriously he felt about the covenants he had made in the temple. He magnified his calling as a home teacher at that time and a Sunday school teacher. He worked hard at applying himself in school, putting forth his best effort. But the thing that really sealed the deal, besides his good looks and charm, was the way he treated me and made me feel. He respected me always and was concerned about my needs. I knew that being his first lady would be a wonderful life for me. Through the years, I have come to learn even more about the many wonderful attributes of my husband. I don't know anyone more obedient than he is. As a young missionary, he had a senior companion who refused to arise on time to study. Elder Bowen arose every morning and studied on his own for several months of his mission. He has continued that pattern of obedience throughout his life. He served in many callings, including bishop, stake president, mission president, and Area 70. In 2006, he received a call from President Hinckley asking him to serve in the first quorum of the 70. <clears throat> this meant that he would no longer continue his successful business, but would go and serve the Lord anywhere in the world as a full-time representative of Jesus Christ. He didn't hesitate a second when President Hinckley issued the call. That is how he has always felt about service in God's kingdom. Working hard, Elder Bowen graduated from BYU with honors and continued studying as he made his career as a financial planner. He was passionate about his work and loved serving his clients. As a result, he was honored as top agent in his company and at the top tier in the worldwide prestigious World er, Million Dollar Roundtable Club. Elder Bowen has always been a delightful companion. He is a loving, giving, concerned father and husband. He is quick to seek forgiveness when he feels he may have offended someone, and is equally quick to forgive someone who has offended him, for which I am particularly grateful. While busily serving in the church and building his business, he always made time to support me and our children in our responsibilities and interests. He coached our children in many sports, attended numerous recitals and concerts, helped with school and scouting assignments, and most of all, taught his children the doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He spent countless hours counseling with our children and continues to do so today. He is always the leader of fun family activities, and our 20 grandchildren just can't live without him. Our six living children had this to say about their father. Liesl said, One thing I love about Dad is the way he instilled confidence and optimism in all of us. He always taught us to never doubt ourselves because we could do anything we set our minds to. If we were feeling sorry for ourselves or saying, I can't, he put an end to that real quick. He taught us that being happy is a choice. And if we weren't happy, we needed to change our attitude. Our daughter Emily said, Throughout my childhood, my dad was consistently patient and forgiving toward me. He was remarkably cool, calm, and collected when my boyfriend accidentally drove my dad's sports car through the refrigerator in the garage, damaging both the refrigerator and the car. <laughs> 
Dad didn't get upset and was so patient and forgiving that later my beau had no fear in asking for my hand in marriage. Our oldest son, Heath, said, everything I have accomplished, I owe to the self-esteem my dad instilled in me as a child. He has always shown that he believes in my ability to accomplish whatever task is placed before me. Trevor said, Dad coached me probably 10 to, 20, or 10 to 12 seasons over the course of my soccer and football career. He was efficient because he was above petty rebuke. Everyone loved him, even the toughest and meanest of kids. One of my teammates was placed in a detention center for troubled youth. Without missing a beat and without any desire to pile on punishment, Dad jumped in the car with a batch of Mom's chocolate chip cookies and headed over to see him. The boy broke down sobbing when he saw Coach Bowen walk through the door with love in his eyes and warm cookies in his hands. Anyone who's known Dad can likely relate to the feelings of seeing our captain appear to restore the solid ground beneath our wayward feet and vanquish the fear with just a hug and a smile. Brecca said, whether I was playing in a soccer game at the age of eight or running a half marathon as an adult, my dad could always be heard above the crowd cheering me on. He has always motiv mated, motivated me to do and be my best. And our youngest daughter, Devin, said, whenever I think of dad, I think of his big bear hugs and the way he would hold me. I especially remember when he told us we were moving to Argentina. She was just a teenager. He put his arms around me and held me close, and I felt like everything was going to be okay. He gives the best bear hugs, and I always feel safe in his arms. As you can see, Elder Bowen has more than filled those requirements that I set for my future companion. And as the years go by, he just gets better and better at developing those attributes, as well as many others. As his wife, I have always felt loved and cherished beyond measure. I'm happy to turn you over to the man who more than delivers the sermon. He demonstrates what he teaches by the way he lives. Wow, we could all go home now and have... <laughs> If I have ever done anything good in my life, it was marrying my sweetheart. And I will be all of eternity striving to be worthy of her. I love her and my family. My dear brothers and sisters, I would like to share with you today something that has changed my life. It is very personal to me, and I hope that some of you will go away today and follow the counsel, the counsel that I will give you. I believe that if you do, years from now, you will be able to look back at this meeting as the meeting that changed your life forever. As taught in Doctrine and Covenants, section 43, I hope that you will go home and bind yourselves to act in all holiness. Let me ask you two questions. First, is God a planner? And while you think about that, let me ask a second question. In the creation of the world, how many creations were there? Some of you are thinking six, some of you are thinking seven, and some of you are thinking countless, and some of you aren't even thinking. So start thinking. We can go to Moses chapter 3, verses 4 and 5 to find the answer. Quote, I, the Lord God, made the heaven and the earth, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For I, the Lord God, created all things of which I have spoken spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth. We learn from this scripture that when the world was created, there were two creations, first the spiritual and then the physical. Which of the two creations do you think was more difficult to perform, the spiritual or the physical? My personal feeling is that the spiritual creation would have been the more difficult. Why? Because it required pondering, creativity, and a vision. When it, came, when it was time for the physical creation, the gods knew exactly what the world would look like. They had seen it and created it spiritually beforehand. They had seen and planned for it in the spiritual creation. 
Another question, why does God send missionaries out to teach the world how to return home to him? Why would we have, why would he have put an entire chapter on planning and preach my gospel? What is God's motivation in all of this? He has clearly stated his purpose. His work and his glory is to bring to pass the immortality and the eternal life of each one of us. Or in simple terms, he loves us and he wants us to return home. Eternal life means God's life, the life he has. Can we really receive all that the Father hath? Absolutely. He has promised us that very thing. The Savior taught, and he that receiveth my Father receiveth my Father's kingdom. Therefore, all that my Father hath shall be given unto him. In order to return home, it requires planning. That way, life doesn't just happen, but rather we can act and direct much of what goes on in our lives. I love this quote from Elder Ballard in chapter 8 of Preach My Gospel. Quote, I am so thoroughly convinced that if we don't set goals in our life and learn how to master the techniques of living to reach our goals, we can reach a ripe old age and look back on our life only to see that we reached but a small part of our full potential. When one learns to master the principles of setting a goal, he will then be able to make a great difference in the results he attains in this life." End of quote. Yes, I believe that God is a planner and that if we want to become like Him and return and live with Him, we need to do what He does. This requires us to have a vision, it requires us to make a plan, and it requires that we set goals. God has a plan for each of us. He has given us a timetable to follow. Specific events should take place at specific times. Strive to stay on God's timetable. For example, if you are old enough to be a priest, be ordained to be a priest. When mission time comes, be on a mission. When marriage time comes, get married. When children, childbearing years come, bear children. One of my favorite scriptures is found in Ecclesiastes. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. As a young missionary in Chile, I had the great privilege of serving the Lord for two wonderful years. In that time, I learned how to pray. I learned what it means to plead with my Father in heaven. I learned what he really, that he really does love me and that he really is my Father. I learned to recognize the Holy Ghost as he would guide and direct me. I learned that he would warn and comfort me in my hour of need. I learned that he truly is the testifier of the Father and the Son and, of, and that anything God wanted me to do was possible. I learned that Jesus is the Christ and that his atonement is for me. I learned that through the Father's plan, with Christ at the center of that plan, that I could return home to my heavenly mansion and once again live with, live with Father and Jesus Christ. I learned that families really are forever. My mission was the hardest thing that I had ever done in my life up until that point. Just before I came home, I had an experience in a cold, dark prison cell where I didn't know if I would ever see my family again. For the first time in my life, I faced the real possibility that my life would be taken. But that is a story for another day. The blessing, one of the blessings of that horrific experience was that I learned very clearly by the power of the Holy Ghost that God loves me and that living His plan is all that matters. 
I wouldn't trade the experiences that I had and the knowledge that I gained as a full-time missionary for anything, or for that matter, for everything that this transient world has to offer. I was blessed to see clearly where I wanted to go and what I needed to do. Young men, if you have not served a mission, serve one. You know you should. The Holy Ghost has already told you that. If you are not worthy, repent and get worthy. Prepare yourself and follow the counsel of the living prophet of God. I promise you that you will never regret it. It will, if, <clears throat> it will bless you and it will lay the foundation for your eternal life. Sisters, I, along with the prophet of God, invite you to serve. After my mission, I was blessed with a beautiful, virtuous woman who you've met, who was full of love for the Lord and for me. At that time, I felt that I needed to have a written plan for my life. As a young father with a young family, I knew that I wanted to be a well-rounded person. I felt that God had taught me what that means. At the beginning of this devotional, I said that if you would follow the counsel that I give you today, I believe that years from now you will be able to look back to this devotional as the meeting that changed your life forever. Well, this is my counsel to you that you create a written plan for your life. The best way for me to teach you how this can be accomplished is by being very personal and sharing my own experience with you. I would like to open to you a window to my soul. I want to share with you what I did when I was 23 years old and let you into my thought process as I wrote my life plan and then have tried to live that plan. Almost 40 years later, I can, I can say that my life has changed forever because of my life plan. I wanted to incorporate into my life plan what I considered to be the three most important aspects of a meaningful life. I wanted to be a whole man. Each person may have different feelings and ideas about what that means. That is the great blessing of individuality that God has given each one of His children. But for me, those three aspects or supporting legs of my life were God, family, and work. I realized that in order for my life to be meaningful and everlasting, that God had to be at the center of everything that I did. I realized that there is no lasting happiness without family. And finally, I realized that if I were going to be happy and be a blessing to my family and others, that I needed to be self-reliant financially, which translated into work. As I set out to conquer the world and myself, I thought, a few, I thought of a few things that I wanted to always remember, thoughts and quotes that would keep me grounded and on course and that would help me remember where I was headed. I wrote down these axioms and quotes, which became an important part of implementing my written life plan. Some of them are as follows. If you always tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. Honesty is the only policy. Don't pray on your knees on Sunday and pray on your neighbor the rest of the week. Will Rogers said, I'm not so concerned about the return on my money as the return of my money. Aristotle said, quality is not an act, it is a habit. And then the famous basketball coach John Wooden said, never mistake activity for achievement. Don't be a legend in your own mind. Now, and you'll have to think about this next one. Don't be a self-made man that worships his creator. Be kind. Everyone is fighting a, bat a hard battle. Everyone is special, but no one is special. Even Moses said after seeing the creations of God, now for this cause I know that man is nothing, which thing I, had, I never had supposed. And Roy Disney, it's not hard to make decisions when you know what your values are. I wrote my plan based on personal values that would guide my future decisions. If my values were right, I knew that by setting short and long-term goals based on and around those values, that I would be able to become the person that I aspire to be and that, and that that person would be pleasing to my Father in Heaven. That is who I am still striving to be, a son of God who is loved and who is pleasing to my Father. I hope that one day as I return home with my family that Heavenly Father can say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. 
I felt empowered as I realized that I could go anywhere I wanted to go and that I could achieve anything that I wanted to achieve. The sky was the limit and I was in charge. How did I start this life-changing process? In the spirit of prayer and meditation, I read and reread my patriarchal blessing. I paid attention to the blessings promised and the talents which God said I had been given. Sometimes I would think, is he talking about me? But I, did, but I decided that if he said I had such a talent, that I had better develop it. I also paid close attention to the warnings and admonitions that I was given. I was grateful that a loving Father in Heaven would warn me of possible pitfalls in my path. If you don't currently have your patriarchal blessing, seek to have a desire to receive one, and then worthily go to your patriarch and receive this wonderful roadmap for your life. I testify that these blessings come directly from God and that He has many wonderful things to tell you to assist you on your travel through, through this life. Then I identified eight values that I wanted to develop in my life. Today, Chapter 6 and Preach My Gospel on Christ-like Attributes would be a great place to study to help you receive the revelation you are seeking. Then fast and pray to know if this is who God wants you to become. I suggest that you choose between eight and ten values. In my thinking, if you have more than that, the task can appear so overwhelming that your resolve probably won't last long. With eight, or t eight to ten life values, you will be able to keep a razor focus and become the person that God and you want to become. I then thought about the person that I wanted people to remember when I am dead. This is called seeing the end from the beginning. I ask myself, what are the things that I want my family and friends and business associates to say about me at my funeral? This helped me realize what is really important in this life and what really isn't. The next step, which may be <clears throat> the most important of all, was to write down the values that would govern my behavior for the rest of my life. You have heard it said that if it is not written down, it is only a fleeting wish. I committed and I had a document to remind me of that commitment for the rest of my life. I then began to carry a copy of my written life plan with me wherever I would go and I would review it often, daily. I would set short and long-term goals in my life based on these values. I carry with me today and review often the very document that I wrote nearly 40 years ago. It still guides my life. It describes the person I want to become. Now, the very personal part. I am going to share with you today my life plan. If you choose to create your own life plan, I don't expect that your plan will be the same as mine. In fact, it shouldn't be because each of us is a unique creation of God. My hope is that you would be able to see the example of my plan, which would help you develop and write down your own unique plan for life. With each of the eight values that I chose, I wrote down positive affirmations. I wanted to describe the person that I wanted to become. As I reviewed on a regular basis those affirmations, I realized that my life was changing and that I was starting to be more like the person I wanted to be. As already mentioned, even today, I have not become the person I hope to become. I am a work in progress. I believe my best days are still ahead of me and that I am slowly but surely becoming the person that God expects me to be and the person that He sent me here to become. Those positive statements over the years have become to me just like the scriptures and my patriarchal blessing. I believe my life plan is an inspired document that God revealed to me many years ago. Writing my plan was a spiritual experience for me. I can't number the times that I have been faced with business situations, personal relationships, or temptations that lines from my life plan have come, to my, come quickly to my mind and have helped me make the right choice. We really are the product of our choices. My life plan ha has been and still is a great blessing and a protection to me on a daily basis. Along with the positive affirmations, I chose scriptures that teach and model the value, <clears throat> the value that I desire. 
I will now share my eight personal values together with the positive affirmations and the scriptures associated with each one. My eight values are, one, spiritual, two, intellectual, three, physical, four, charitable, five, cleanliness, six, patience, seven, positive, eight, integrity. Number one, spiritual. I am a spiritual person. I recognize the Lord in all aspects of my life. I pray with real intent morning and night personally. I pray over our meals and with my family each morning. I read the scriptures daily for at least 15 minutes. I always have family home evening with my family. I fast with real purpose each month. Spirituality is on the top of my priority list. Doctrine, Doctrine and Covenants 6 and 36, look unto me in every thought, doubt not, fear not. Matthew 6 and 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Two, intellectual. I am an intellectual person with an insatiable desire for knowledge. I read at least one book each month unrelated to my fantastic business. I take the time to write down and look up words that I don't use or fully understand. I keep sharp in my business by pursuing professional designations and regularly reading the trade magazines. Doctrine and Covenants 130, 18 through 19. Whatever principle of intelligence we attain unto in this life, it will rise with us in the resurrection. And if a person gains more knowledge and intelligence in this life through his diligence and obedience than another, he will have so much the advantage in the world to come. Three, physical. I am an athletic 190 pounds. I eat good food and never overeat. I do 50 push-ups and 50 sit-ups daily. I enjoy being healthy never get colds, and am full of energy. Doctrine and Covenants, section 89, verses 18 through 20. And all saints who remember to keep and do these sayings, walking in obedience to the commandments, shall receive health in their navel and marrow to their bones, and shall find wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures, and shall run and not be weary, and shall walk and not faint. Four, I am a charitable person. I believe in the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I believe in the win-win philosophy, if you win, I win. I believe that as ye sow, so shall ye reap. All of my business as well as personal decisions are made with these three axioms in mind. I always ask the question, what would the Savior do? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, charity suffereth suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemingly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Five, cleanliness. I am a clean person in appearance, body, mind, and habitation. I am physically clean. I put everything in its place. I am clean in mind. I haven't time to clutter my mind with trash. I, clear, I think clearly and fill my mind with virtuous thoughts and lofty ideals. Doctrine and Covenants section 132, verse 8. Behold, mine house is a house of order, saith the Lord God, and not a house of confu- confusion. Six, patience. I am a patient person. I am in command of my emotions at all times. I don't raise my voice. I reason with my children and others, rather than intimidating or forcing my will upon them. Proverbs 15 and 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Proverbs 15, verse 18. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. Proverbs 16 and 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Number seven, positive. I am a positive person. I maintain a positive attitude always. 
I am an eternal optimist. I love a new challenge and look for the best in all people and situations. I believe in people. Number eight, integrity. I am a person of impeccable integrity. I have the moral courage to make my actions consistent with my knowledge of right and wrong. Job 27 and 5. Till I die, I will not remove mine integrity from me. My dear young brothers and sisters, where do you want to go? Plot your course. The power is yours. I testify that you are literally sons and daughters of God. He knows you and he loves you. He wants you to come home. He has provided every needful thing to allow you to return home clean and prepared to receive all that he has. He has given us his only begotten in the flesh, even Jesus Christ, to atone for our sins and mistakes and to be there to succor us in our afflictions. He is our Redeemer and our Savior. He is literally the physical and spiritual Son of God. He is unique. Only through Him can we return to the presence of the Father. God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ visited the prophet Joseph and this the dispensation of the fullness of times. Joseph was and is the prophet of the restoration. Let the world rail on the prophet Joseph. It makes no difference. They are only fulfilling prophecy. I know him to be a prophet of integrity and courage. He is a covenant keeper. I know this because I have met, not because I have met him, but because I have read the Book of Mormon. I know by the power of the Holy Ghost that the book is true. God's power, which is the Holy Priesthood, has been restored to the earth, and the power to become like God and to receive all that he has is once again upon the earth. That power is manifest in the holy temples of God. I testify that there are living prophets, seers, and revelators again upon the face of the earth, and that there is one, even Thomas S. Monson, who holds all priesthood keys and has authority from God to exercise those keys in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.